Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our gospel lesson. I read again Mark 7, verse 8. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of man. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Who doesn't love a good tradition? Our lives are full of them. Who doesn't love a good fireworks show on the 4th of July, at least here in the United States? Speaking of America, traditionally, we have a seventh inning stretch in a baseball game, like we did just this past Friday. Or there's the traditional throwing out of the first pitch of the season. Traditionally, children get a summer vacation here in the United States. How many adults remember fondly those carefree days of summer? Somehow they disappear once you get out of school. According to tradition, men open doors for women. According to tradition, women are allowed to wear hats inside, but men aren't supposed to. According to tradition, we're all going to have turkey on Thanksgiving. And who doesn't love a great turkey? Not only do we have the generally accepted national traditions, like what I've been talking about, but we also have personal traditions. On more than one occasion, I have received phone calls asking whether or not we have a midnight Christmas Eve worship service. Now, the people who make these calls may not go to church at all the rest of the year, but they have a personal tradition that they go to church midnight Christmas Eve. Some people, some families, have a traditional place that they go for vacation every year. Maybe every year they go to Myrtle Beach, who knows? But it's the same place, the family tradition. You may be a bowler and you traditionally tap the limit line, the foul line, I mean, <laughs> before you actually deliver your bowling ball. Whatever the tradition might be, and some might call some of these traditions anyways a superstition, we all seem to have them. This is true, actually, all over the world, though their traditions may be very different from ours. In fact, this is so common that there has never been a society found, past or present, or culture, that does not have traditions. Who knows? Perhaps it's part of the very nature of being human. What I do know is that tradition is a very powerful force for good or evil in our lives. Religion in general, and certainly Christianity, has not avoided traditions. Traditionally, we do our catechism class in the seventh and eighth grade. Traditionally, our worship services are on Sunday. Traditionally, we have Wednesday worship services during Advent and Lent. Traditionally, our pastors wear robes on Sunday. Traditionally, we adorn our worship areas with the best art that we can. Traditionally, we sing chorales in our church. Other churches, other uh, denominations have a different tradition, and they sing in other styles. But the list goes on and on and on. Individual churches also develop their own local traditions. Traditionally, we do our announcements at the beginning of our worship service. But at the church I came from in South Carolina, we traditionally did our announcements at the end of the worship service. Traditionally, we end our time here today together with me saying, go in peace to serve the Lord, and the congregation responds, Amen. thanks be to God. We didn't do that in South Carolina. 
There are all sorts of traditions that we observe, either as a local congregation or as a denomination. And they do intend to enhance our time together and therefore serve a beneficial function. The Jews in Jesus' day were no different. They also had traditions, lots of them, just like us. They had traditional holidays. And I'm not talking about the ones outlined in the Old Testament like Passover, but non-biblical ones like Hanukkah. Though, of course, you would also include those biblical ones as part of their tradition. Those Jews also had traditional clothing, traditional food, traditional greetings, traditional activities. And just about any place else that we have a tradition, they had a tradition also. But something had gone wrong in reference to their tradition. And by their example, we might be able to see how our tradition can go wrong and help us to keep them in their proper place. Jesus addresses how a Jewish tradition had supplanted the word of God. However, that very tradition had been founded on the word of God. We all know the first commandment, don't we? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We have all heard the warnings that anything can supplant God, even the love of family. The first commandment is first, not simply because something had to be first, you know, and, and God just reached into some sort of cosmic grab bag and pulled it out, but it's first because all of the other commandments actually flow from the first commandment. So to break any commandment is to break the first commandment. But this is the very line of reasoning that the scribes used for the tradition that Jesus is referring to in our gospel lesson today. God is number one in all things. If, they argued, something had been dedicated to God, you cannot reverse that dedication in order to do something else even something as important as caring for your parents. God is first, they reason, not your parents. However, they forgot that God has not commanded us to dedicate this, that, or the other thing to him. He has commanded us to honor our father and our mother. So if it comes to a choice between helping the church recover the pews or making sure your parents have a roof over their head, you opt for making sure your parents have a roof over your head, even if you have dedicated some money to the pew cushion fund. After you have made sure that they have a roof over their head, if God has so favored you that you still have some extra money, then you can give to the pew fund. The scribes had it the other way around. People, being what they are, and that is, of course, fallen sinners, made it even worse. They would put the temple in their will and then refuse to care for their parents under the pretense that that money, which would be given to the temple some years in the future, had been dedicated to God. Sadly, the scribes supported this understanding. And I guess because it would bring money into the temple treasury. So the scribes and the people twisted the word of God to their own advantage and the disadvantage of their neighbor. In this case, their neighbor being their parents. This example is a strong warning to us to not twist the word of God because of our traditions and it is very easy to do. Everyone, pastors included, need to be on guard against this. But the misuse of tradition does not have to be so blatantly greedy as it is in our reading. Anytime a tradition is used as a higher standard than the word of God, it is being misused. 
I remember one circuit event I attended when I was down south. I was standing in the back while the announcements were being made during the worship service. A layman that I was next to casually told me that he would never attend this particular church because the announcements were being done wrong. Right, of course, is how the announcements were handled in his home congregation. I doubt seriously that he was very happy with my response. He didn't say anything else to me the whole time we were there. The simple fact is he had elevated local practice above unity in doctrine. He valued, though he didn't realize it, how announcements were handled more than he valued the atoning death of Jesus and the people Jesus died for. He could go, we could go on with any traditional element, especially those we observe on Sunday morning in our worship service. To insist that candles or pews or how an offering is taken up or what kind of musical instruments are used or music in general or how a pastor dresses or what sort of decorations adorn the altar area and the rest of our worship area. Any, if any, uh, because some churches don't have anything, or require a certain dress code of the laity, you know, you can't come to church because you don't dress the right way, or get in a huff over whether or not a person makes the sign of the cross or doesn't, or if people stand or kneel at communion, or if you immerse people or, or pour over people or sprinkle sprinkle people during baptism, or whether you use individual or common cup during communion, or if you recognize saints' days or don't, or even if your main weekly worship service is on Sunday. To elevate any of these things is to elevate tradition above the word of God. To elevate tradition above the neighbor we are charged to love. Indeed, to elevate tradition above unity in the gospel and Christ himself. This is what our confessions say on the topic. And remember, the confessions are what every Lutheran subscribes to. This is what every Lutheran, no matter what brand of Lutheran you are, we say we believe the Bible teaches. And that says, we believe, teach, and confess that the community of God in every locality and every age has the authority to change such ceremonies and practices according to circumstances as it may be most profitable and edifying to the community of God. In that same article, we also hear churches will not condemn each other because of a difference in ceremonies. When in Christian liberty, one uses fewer or more of them, as long as they are otherwise agreed in doctrine and all its articles. According to the well-known axiom, disagreement in fasting should not destroy agreement in faith. Our unity is based on agreement in doctrine, not uniformity in tradition. That is why when the Missouri Center was first formed, it was common to find a half dozen different hymnals in the same congregation being used by the people in the pew. Unity relies in our sharing one faith, not one hymnal. That is why we have Missouri Synod congregations that speak English, of course we know that, but also German, Slovakian, Spanish, and so forth. Our unity in Christ is in Christ, not in a, our language. And that is why we can have Missouri Synod congregations that use contemporary pop style music or even jazz style music. Our unity is not based on our taste in music, but in the God who we worship. St. Paul had it right when he wrote, 
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that call, belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. By gra his, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul does not mention one governing style. He does not mention one Sunday morning liturgy and so forth. All these things that people get so worked up about. Such things don't even come close to being part of the picture for St. Paul. So when tradition gets in the way of our unity in Christ and his word, it is tradition that must give way. The scribes had forgotten that, and they let their tradition surplant Christ and his word. All that being said, traditions are actually a good thing when kept in their place. We have the tradition of worshiping on Sundays because we recognize that ever since the first century, Christians have worshipped on Sundays. We chose this day because it was a way to honor Christ. Not only did Christ rise from the dead on a Sunday, but Christ sent the Holy Spirit, the first Pentecost, on a Sunday. And we even know that God began creation on a Sunday. So by worshipping on Sunday, we recognize our creation and our recreation in Christ. We do this freely, not by command, but by choice and freedom. If a person can't worship on Sunday and their church offers a worship service on Wednesday or some other day of the week for that matter, that is fine. As long as we agree in the gospel, we extend the right hand of fellowship. We use both ancient and modern, modern chorale tunes and texts in our worship service, not because they are the only proper form of music for worship, but because we recognize Christians have used this form for centuries, that it is an excellent way to communicate our one faith and our one Lord and because to dispense with them is to turn our back on great treasures of wisdom and truth handed down to us. It is not though commanded. We are free to use them. We recognize saints not because we are commanded to but because they can be a great inspiration to us for our day to day life. We observe the church year, again, by choice and not by compulsion. We see in it a way that ties us to the one church that extends back through time, not only to Jesus, but all the way back to Adam and Eve. It provides us with a way to order our days in light of the redemptive work of Christ. It lifts up the one faith, one church, the one Lord, that we value. We use the hymnal not because it is the only true way to worship, but because we recognize that it is a great way to worship. Its liturgies have been refined through the ages and carry pure gold. Our Christian tradition is a great gift and shapes us in a Christ-like way. But our traditions are never to replace Christ or his word. Because we are who we are, that is human beings, we will always have traditions. So it behooves us to have them shaped by the word of God. We choose to make use of the wealth of the Christian traditions, not because we are mandated, but because we see the value in using them. That is the proper place of tradition. As servant, as teacher, as messenger, but not as Lord. 
that honor belongs to Jesus alone. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.